we always throw away old clothes. Ending is better than mending. That's a quote from Brave New World, which was written in 1931. What do you think of that, Aaron? Seems kind of familiar to me. Yeah, it seems relevant today. That's a great literary start to this episode, which is the third in our fashion series. If you've been following along, we started off just talking about design and our own um, kind of personal histories with fashion. And then the second episode spoke to the history of fashion, especially how the industry ended up in its current unsustainable way. And then today we're really just going to be talking about modern sustainability issues. Yeah, we're going to be doing kind of a life cycle analysis of a piece of clothing, I suppose, from its growth in whatever materials it consists of to its purchase and eventual throwing away, I guess. Yeah. So let's just get straight into it. I'd say. Um, this <laughs> reminds me of like a sustainability or environmental science class because life cycle analyses are very, um, very common in those. Yeah, they're common ways to kind of do t case studies of why things are unsustainable. Sometimes they'll like pick one thing and kind of do a whole course on it. I think and, I like, might have even done one about clothing. Probably. I remember definitely doing one about a hamburger and all the different, <laughs> <laughs> all the different ingredients which, which yeah. it consists of. And today we're going to be doing one about a generic, non-specified piece of clothing. Mm -hmm. So I will start because I covered materials. Yes, Aaron loves materials. So most clothes today, it seems, are made of cotton, mm -hmm. which is kind of the big sustainable, sustainability villain. Yeah. I hear a lot about it in school because it's really bad. Everyone probably knows this. Um, it's really bad for water usage. It's very water intensive to grow as well as to use. It takes a lot of land. So there's like mm -hmm. a ton of conversion of forestry for agro use for cotton. And it also uses a lot of agrochemicals, pesticides, etc. One stat I saw was that cotton accounts for about one sixth of global pesticide use. I guess it's such a big crop. It kind of makes sense. Yeah. It takes. But it also just like is really susceptible to insects. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> That's why it has to use so much. Some other stats about it taking a lot of water. I saw that it takes up to 3,000 gallons of water to make a single t-shirt and up to 10 to 20,000 gallons to make a pair of jeans. You must I, know all about this. I saw those same stats about water usage and I saw them like converted to how much water a person, like how long it would take them to drink that. So it's like for a cotton t-shirt, it would be enough water for a person for three years or three and a half years drinking eight cups a day. Then for the pair of jeans, it'd be 10 years. Yeah. You're using the water that could like sustain a life, basically. Basically, I think cotton is used because it's kind of a cheap crop to grow and it has like a history and most mm -hmm. people just used to the, used to the cotton t-shirt and the industry has kind of grown up around that, I suppose. Yeah, or that makes sense. Some other common materials used are broadly lumped under a category of synthetics. This includes mostly polyester, but also things like nylon. And these are usually made from oil. I saw that these are also really bad for different reasons. They're not so land intensive nor so water intensive. But obviously, since they're made from oil, they're dependent on a fossil fuel industry, um, which people might not associate with fashion, but is actually pretty uh, deeply entwined, not just in the materials, but as we'll get into later in shipping. And also with synthetics, they're not typically biodegradable. So come the end of the lifespan of the piece of clothing, that is an issue. Yeah, and I'll get into that a bit later. I never really realized that there were so many like oil-based products in clothing. I just kind of assumed they were all crops, but then you realize pretty much everything is not just strictly cotton or any other like linen or hemp. It's almost always mixed with polyester. Yeah, maybe like we can talk stretchy. about this because that's like seemingly integral to most modern clothes, I would say. Like when I think about like modern clothing, I think about techno wear and jumpsuits or like mm -hmm. sporting equipment and stuff. And it's like, that stuff all seems cool, but then it's like, well, it has a lot of polyester and nylon and synthetics. That just makes it innately unsustainable, especially when it's linked with fast fashion and it's going to like not live for very long. Mm -hmm. There might be a kind of eco polyester. This is one area of just production of things in general where I'm fine with it being kind of super technological and futuristic and space age in the materials which are used because i don't know i just think that's cool to be wearing like really advanced fabrics yeah that's kind of what you think of when you think of like future space people they're wearing these like cool jumpsuits that help you breathe sustain you so those are two of the most bad kind of categories of clothing 
One caveat with cotton is that recycled cotton is obviously good. You're just kind of saving waste. Yeah, exactly. You're not directly using any land or water or pesticides or anything like that. Organic cotton is kind of, I think, in vogue. From what I can tell is that it uses less land or uses land differently and obviously not Mm -hmm. so much of the chemicals, but it still takes a ton of water to produce, to grow. Some of the good materials that I saw were wool and other environmental alternatives like hemp, linen, as I said, recycled cotton. Another bad one was leather. I think that's oh, well yeah. known. Makes sense. But like I never realized it was bad from an environmental emissions perspective. I only ever because you only ever hear of that conversation kind of dominated by animal rights. Mm-hmm. So like the ethics. But it also just kills a ton of cows. But like to do that it has to raise a, a ton of cows. Yeah, and they take a ton of land and take a ton of land and emit a ton of methane, which is bad. And also like the chemicals used for tanning leather. I saw were both mm-hmm. bad for the environment and have like a crazy high uh, rate of causing illness in the people handling it yeah it always seemed toxic whenever i read about it in books even if they're fiction it was just like this seems not good yeah like you're turning skin into a material seems seems wrong do you think leather looks cool it's hard to say because it's hard to like separate it from the feeling of leather which is just like sticky and i feel sticky. like it just seems really hot to wear i like the way those kind of rawhide like cowboy stuff looks uh, yeah but not like a leather jacket no. This is obviously kind of <laughs> irrelevant because we're denouncing it all as bad. Um, yes. Even if it looked really cool. But, but like, it, there's fake leather. There's mushroom leather. Mushroom leather? Yeah. What's that like? <laughs> it just looks like leather, but it's but, made of mushrooms somehow. I think they, like, tan the mushrooms. But, okay. like, somehow mesh it all in. I don't know. Um, another such futuristic slash technological fabric I found was called kumonos. It was so just, not it was kimonos. K- k- no, k- Cumonus, just the letter Q. It was kind of a clump of consonants, so it's hard to pronounce. But basically, it was this Australian company who made... It was basically a synthetic spider silk. And it said... They say it was... They say that it's five times stronger than steel and also biodegradable. What? <laughs> but that's what I'm saying. Like, I'm sure there's just a ton of those. Like, there'll be some random startup in Portland who has this outrageously strong and good fabric... Like, they have no money or no distribution or anything. steel. So, like, that could just be used as, like... You can just cook it up in a lab. I'm sure there's tons of stuff like this. Yeah, that makes sense. We've all seen Spider-Man. Most of my questions with these environmental fabrics are, how durable are they? Like, when I hear about mushroom leather, like, like, is that going to last? Is it going to, like, start biodegrading? Yeah, is it going to melt if it gets wet? Um, But I don't actually think that's the case. I think that's just kind of maybe the appearance of it. Yeah, I think so, because, like, cotton's super biodegradable. Like, you could basically, I think if something was 100% cotton, it could begin, like, breaking down within a week and be completely broken down in, like, five weeks. Is that true? I read that on the internet. It doesn't seem true, though, because I've had a lot of 100% cotton shirts. Have you ever thrown them in the garden? Oh, I thought you meant biodegrading on you. No, but that's, the, like, as soon as you throw it into the garden, it's going to start biodegrading. That's kind of, like, my worry with, like, mushroom leather it's like wouldn't it just start doing it on you but if cotton doesn't do it maybe these eco fabrics won't either do you know of any other cool eco fabrics slash materials i haven't looked into it i was keeping the optimism for next week okay i was all of my things are the most doom most gloom yeah mine is similar so this is about as positive as it gets so the episode basically peaked in terms of happiness with uh, mushroom leather yeah i think just because those two (laughs) words put together kind of make me smile a little bit yeah, you um, can kind of imagine fairies wearing it. <laughs> like, look at the it sounds smile. Kind of, it sounds kind of cottage y Yeah. If you're interested in cottage core. <laughs> we have this really sick episode. Yeah, you can listen to our episode <laughs> cottage core in which we discuss a ton more about mushrooms. Um, <laughs> so that's what I had for materials. It's kind of, I don't know if this is me because I tread sustainable ground a lot academically and online, but I, I knew like most of it. I knew the basic stuff, cotton, bad wool good hemp best like, <laughs> yeah i think feel like we hear that a lot i feel like it's this kind of subconscious thing like if someone said which is better cotton or hemp you would just know because of the look of it like hemp and linen look more natural it's probably because we see them a lot on instagram though yeah that's on sustainable true. yeah aesthetics but like cotton when it's used it's so far from like it's natural state oh because it's so transformed yeah. Is that what you mean? Because when I was looking into the manufacturing, 
it's like they take the cotton, they bleach it. There's so many things added to it to make it white and make it into the fabric. And I'll get into that later, but it's just like cotton isn't naturally this pure white that we're used to. I thought it was. I don't think. Like, I'm sure on the bush it looks white. Yeah. But as soon as you start like threading it together, okay, there's so many sense. impurities. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. Okay, so that's what I had for materials. Moving on from that, of course, we have... Labor and manufacturing. Yeah. I broke those into two because they're both really big. So labor in the fashion industry is basically has no standards most places in the world and most companies use some form of slave labor we are very aware of that and i kind of imagine most of our listeners are aware of that but there's a lot of people who have no idea because why would you think there's slave labor still we're so far removed from it you know yeah when i was a kid i just assumed there were no more slaves because all we're taught in school is like no slavery ended but that was just in north america <laughs> it was a very North American way of thinking, I suppose. So, I looked mainly on UNICEF, which is mainly focused on children's rights. Okay. And they quoted an article from the International Labor Organization that said there's 260 million children engaged in employment in some way. Some of it isn't slave or, like, considered child labor because it meets the standards set out by the UN for like children working because like some people just have farms and their kids just like help out and that's fine but 170 million are considered to be child slaves which means they're either working illegally under like the country's regulations about child labor or they're in like a very obviously dangerous situation exposed to chemicals not allowed to go to school just a threat basically Almost all of them are in the garment and textile industry in some way or another, be it harvesting cotton, because apparently small fingers are good for harvesting cotton. Where does this slave labor go on, you ask? Let me guess. Wait, okay. do you have countries? Yeah, I have a list of countries. Um, and it's in all stages, so it's like every country that harvests like cotton is one of their main exports, except for the United States, uses mainly child and like forced labor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you can guess. I'm not going to guess, actually. It seems like a gross game. Kind of. But maybe Vietnam? Vietnam isn't on the list, but probably. Because a lot of our clothes are made in Vietnam. That's what, I, that's what I was basing that off. Yeah. Apparently the biggest one is Bangladesh for the actual, like, sewing and dyeing and stuff. Okay. They overtook China recently as, like, the biggest exporter of textiles. And then for actually, like, harvesting the cotton, India and China are, like, the two biggest exporters of cotton. And other materials, but we're going to focus on cotton for this. And then also Uzbekistan, Egypt, Pakistan, and Thailand. And also Benin. Hmm. But there's a ton of countries that export textiles because it's like the second biggest industry in the world. besides Be Behind food? Besides food, yeah. Well, I don't consider myself very knowledgeable about like global inequality. Mm -hmm. So it seems so overwhelming to try and even dismantle or to try and tackle but i guess we can just call this kind of the labor which props up the western way of living mm -hmm. or the western way of dressing in this case yeah and we kind of talked about like the evolution of the fashion industry last week yep. but i didn't realize how accelerated like how far up on the hockey stick curve we are right now because between, like, 2000 and 2014, people started consuming, like, 60% more clothing and wearing it for half the time. So that's just in the last, well, that was, like, 2014. So in 14 years, yeah, it almost doubled. And it's just kind of crazy. And it's supported by these people working in absolutely terrible conditions. They don't know what they're getting into. I read in a, a case study that was set in India. And it's these people, like recruiters from big multinationals, so like Zara, H&M, go to these tiny like rural towns and they say to like someone's parents, they say, we'll give you like housing, three nutritious meals, a wage. And then at the end of the three years, you'll be able to get this lump sum payment and you can leave, is what they tell them. So like seems like a pretty sweet deal, especially if you're living in poverty. But then obviously none of that happens. And it's how a lot of like children get roped into this industry and women. Because if you promised like money and a safe 
place, like, you're going to take it. So it's just very exploitative. And, like, all of the big corporations basically say, like, we have no idea what's going on. Like, the people we're sourcing from say it's fine, but then they, like, contract these, like, sketchy places. But almost all of them, like, literally almost all of the clothing that's produced is produced unethically. So I know you said today's going to be doom and gloom, and then next week I suppose we'll be talking more solutions. Yeah. Do we have any? Are we just going to leave it at that, though? Like, who can we at least pin some blame on? Is it us, the consumers? Is it um, UNICEF? Is it governments? Is it the co- strictly the corporations? Obviously, they're the perpetrators, but I like to look at the world as if, okay, corporations going to do whatever they can to make money. Yeah. You know, like, they have no ethics. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's, it's the job of everyone else to uh, restrain them. Yeah. But the thing is, like, so many governments are, like, bought out by Complicit. corporations. That's what I was thinking. So it seems like there should be some kind of, you mentioned there are no industry-wide standards. It seems like there should be some kind of UNICEF, but with teeth, some kind of fashion governing body or something. Yeah, like the UN's kind of trying. They have this list. It's called the Fair Wear Foundation. There's only 120 companies on it. So, <laughs> like, <laughs> like, I think the UN needs to just, but, like, if they became cutthroat, they would just become obsolete. All the countries would just leave it, probably, the member countries. Yeah, so I don't really know what the what the solution is. I know. That's why I left it for next week, because that's going to be a big thing, I think. Yeah, try and untangle. Yeah. I don't know. I think it's going to have to be a real push for, like, a change in way of life, maybe. Maybe look at other industries, which I, none come to mind, but which maybe were at one point incredibly exploitative, which have been cleaned up. And yeah. just try and follow that lead. Because really to an know. extent, this has been in the United States and yeah. Europe. Like, well, it used to be the local, like, children. Yeah, but the only, that wasn't fixed. It was just outsourced. I know. But, like... <laughs> and magnified or yeah. And multiplied. Yeah. Who knows? Um, so that's labor, everybody. Or do you yeah. have even more? I just flipped the page over and there's a lot more over here. <laughs> <laughs> but, um... Let's see. There's 60 to 75 million people in the world employed by the garment industry. And in 2000, there were only 20 million. So, like, it's just going crazy. Like, and three quarters of them are female. Um, I had a couple stats on just, like, people employed in the garment industry. Okay. So, the lowest retail workers are paid $9 US per day. I mean, per hour. Well, that's not even too bad. And that's at H&M. They're paying the people selling the clothes $9 an hour. Okay, yeah. Okay, okay. And then the people picking cotton is $2 per day or nothing. And then in the United States, people picking cotton or harvesting it get $40,000 a year. So, like, where you are in the world, harvesting cotton, like, really matters. It's not all over the place, mainly just not local. Yeah. My, my thing with, I guess my next... The next point after production, I had specifically was something like offshore manufacturing slash shipping, like the fact of it being outsourced rather than the act of it yeah. being made. The thing is, like, there's no way to ensure um, uniformity among those figures. Mm-hmm. That the people manufacturing in the U.S. are making the same as the people manufacture as the kids manufacturing in Bangladesh. Mm-hmm. Um, it's really about degrowth. I think so so that one there isn't such a heavily skewed this country produces this for the rest of the world kind of thing yeah and so it's, it's a more local production yeah that makes sense because then you would just know because like a lot of the excuses by like corporations like well it's just too complex a network like you get your cotton from here it's manufactured here it's sold here like they say it's too complex i'm like well then simplify it i guess yes okay. and I read this crazy thing. It was like 40% of children's clothing that's produced in the world is made of two factories in China. Just two. And I was like, that's so dependent. Like, what? If something happened to one of those, then there would just be a 20% decrease in the children's clothing produced? Yeah. Well, I had this question to you the other day, which seemed dumb to me at the time. Like, it sounded like one of those questions which are, like, almost rhetorical. Like, it's, like, easy fix. But I was like... How come all the locally produced 
products, not just clothing, but let's say clothing. Let's say you have like a locally produced, quote unquote, artisanal hat store. Mm -hmm. I was like, how come back in the day before industrialization and globalization, like poor people could afford those hats, but now those are reserved for rich people? Yeah, good and point. My, thinking about it in my head, it's a hard question to Google because like, it just seems obvious. But then when I thought about it, I was like, but why though? I guess one, the skill of making the hats, like one person doing it, has become much rarer, so it costs more. Yeah. I think that's probably the main thing. But also it's just something like it was replaced by cheap hats made from some other country mm -hmm. where the labor is less, uh, cost less, and so does the material, and so does the production. And so that somehow like bumped like the artisanal hats further up the classes yeah and i think it like reduced the minimum wage kind of like obviously minimum wage is more now but it probably covers less hmm. like you can work a minimum wage full-time job and not be able to afford rent yeah but i feel like it's probably a really simple economic phenomena yeah but it's just i don't know it, it struck me as like all of a sudden i was like this is so weird it I is. know it sounds really dumb, right? I always ask those kinds of questions to my parents, and they'd be like, just kind of be like, what? Just yeah. not get it. And, like, even I don't get it, but it's just, like, <laughs> it's weird. I, I remember being like, why are gushers cheaper <laughs> than an apple? I'm like, it takes these crazy chemicals oh, and factory yes. institutions, yes. whereas an apple, you just pick off a tree. Yeah, it's the same with, um, like, so soda and water. Yeah. <laughs> we probably just need to... Uh, pay attention next time we take intro to economics but yeah <laughs> <laughs> no but it's important even if these things people are rolling their eyes listening to this being like well yeah duh you guys are dumb or it's whatever like we also feel a well duh it's but like, it's just but why it's, it's really important to to not to not ever be okay with it i think yeah like, you should always be questioning it. you should always be upset about it you should mm -hmm. always be confused by it you shouldn't just be like oh yeah you know soda's more expensive than water what are you gonna do about it like you yeah. should, or like um the same with clothes you should always be kind of upset about that i think oh like, yeah the thing that mary makes in the corner is obviously more expensive than the thing that's imported across the world made yeah. by like a team of 50 people this is this is the job of this episode to make everyone miserable and angry mm -hmm. but maybe like if you're really not feeling that save it for next week and then you can listen to them back to back Ooh. you know a double header yeah. this is our first like double header set of podcasts i suppose yeah. i don't think it is but i suppose <laughs> so now a bit more into manufacturing i suppose okay you talked a bit about the kind of more philosophical questions of manufacturing, like why is everything made so far away? Yeah. I'm going to give a few like how it's made, like the TV show, which I really liked growing up. And now I get to do an episode of it myself. So on this week's episode of how it's made, we're going to talk about the environmental impact of manufacturing clothing. 60% of garments contain polyester should have thrown that out at the beginning yeah and polyester takes two to three times more carbon than cotton right because it's really made from oil yes uh, and it doesn't break down whereas cotton does mm -hmm. so polyester is the real bad guy maybe should be like the mascot for unsustainability instead of cotton i think the problem is that as i was mentioning like polyester just doesn't have a replacement cotton has it's like oh you know just use hemp in for your t-shirts or oh, wool. Yeah. It's like, okay, the polyester, it's like, well, I don't know, I like this sports stuff. There's, like, there's no sustainable well, there's, like, nylon. equivalent yet. Nylon's also... Uh, Isn't it, like, made in a lab? Yeah, it's also a synthetic using oil. I didn't know it used oil. I said it earlier. I didn't register it. Sorry. You didn't. I didn't <laughs> The degrowth of these things has to come along with just a change in, like, the cycles. Like, you can't keep changing your clothes every few days. It has to be made durably, and maybe it can include a little bit of polyester... But you have to not throw it out after a year. You have to extend its lifespan yeah. to kind of like justify the use of the carbon. Yeah. It's kind of how I feel about everything. It's like you can own that microwave. We don't have to stop producing plastic, basically. Yeah. Just use it until it starts to break down naturally. So you have to use it for a couple million and years. And also stop using it yeah. remotely as much. Mm -hmm. Fashion industry is responsible for 10% of global carbon emissions. Second largest consumer of water next to agriculture so then i kind of went into the actual like chemicals associated with manufacturing 
because until this week's episode, I didn't think too much about it. I just said the fashion industry pollutes the environment, which then harms the people making the clothes and obviously the environment. And so I went into like the specific chemicals that are used, their purpose, like why are they used and then their impact on human health and just like obviously the environmental impact of it. So textile dyeing is kind of the biggest issue. The bleaching, bleach is obviously bad for people and like just kills environments. And then like the dyeing is like kind of the next biggest thing because almost everything is dyed Yep. from what I can tell. And to make things bright, they use lead, which we're not allowed to put in things anymore because it's so bad for people. It impacts childhood development. So like these kids working in these factories are being basically stunted their development. And it also causes lead poisoning and everyone, when it gets into the water, pollutes it and makes it undrinkable. And then all of the animals would die from lead poisoning. There's like these crazy pictures of like these rivers or like these ponds that are basically just like this neon red. Wow. Because like all the dye is being dumped into them. Uh, the next chemical that I discovered was, it's like the chemical names, it's like nonol, so it's like nine phenyl. So it's just this like... Just say it all. <laughs> Don't tease us, just say it all. <laughs> nonol, phenyl, ethylates, and nonophenols which is just like a detergent something in like <laughs> the industrial detergent you're going to talk about it later but like actually washing clothes but this is like when they get the cotton in yeah they like soak it in this stuff and causes like hormone disturbances it's the industrial <laughs> scale of all this which is the biggest issue yeah <laughs> like i'm just picturing huge vets and like kids walking over it barefoot on like wooden precariously placed wooden planks and like tossing clothes into yeah. this huge vets of non-phenyl exophyllate yeah um which is almost certainly not how it is but i'm just thinking of it as like mordor yeah there's like that scene in lord of the rings there's like a studio ghibli movie and she gets like trapped with these pirates and she's like washing clothes in these like really steamy rooms yeah that's kind of the image i get because she just keeps getting like dumped with these like loads of clothes on top of her yeah yeah it's not good there's just like literally nothing good about it but i wanted to bring to like just how like the specifics of the not good because i didn't really think about the specifics of like the pollution and like the health impacts until now so yeah those deter detergents basically cause reproductive systems to like either just not develop or like revert because it messes up people's hormones and that's not good. And then it also obviously does that to the animals exposed to these things. And because it just kills the surrounding ecosystems. Like all of these factories, it's like the factory. And then there's just no life around it because they pump all this stuff into the environment. Yeah, of course. Because of the because of the amount, because of the volume. Yeah. And because it's all in one place. The next thing is like plasticizers, which makes things more malleable. So that's used when like making all of those like Dollarama toys, basically. But also when you're like, you know, those like plasticky prints on shirts. Yes. It's to make those flexible. Okay. Because like, why would this plastic all of a sudden be like flexible into a t-shirt? They add these things. They're called, they're, it's like platelets, but it's like pH. It's like platelets. <laughs> I don't know. I don't or plasticizers. Know. I'm like <laughs> struggling with these words. It's because they're all like the chemical names and I haven't taken biology in three years. Um, yeah. They mess with endocrine and then also hormones linked to breast cancer not good running um, the, the full gamut of health issues yeah it's like a basically yeah so it's like not only are these people in like these conditions where they're not eating not safe they're also just exposed to all this and then it, this also obviously kills everything in the environment i'm gonna go through all of the chemicals next is polyfluorinated chemicals which makes things water resistant we always talk about why aren't things water resistant I don't know. Um, so <laughs> there's these things, and they cause immunodeficiencies, endocrine disturbances, liver and pancreas issues, kidney disease, and cancer. And these are also, like, in the clothes we're wearing. Yeah. So not only just, like, obviously when they're in the massive quantities, they're hurting the people in the environment, but also, like, why are we... Like, Do you think there's any danger to this? Do you actually think that? I don't know. Because when I was looking into those, like, household chemicals, and, like, as the 
carbon in the atmosphere increases like it starts reacting with like hardware things okay like it actually cause like they become carcinogenic when the carbon in the atmosphere changes mm -hmm. that's a very chemistry thing yeah it starts to sound kind of conspiratorial it's, it's way above my head anyway mine as well i would just have to believe whatever i'm told on it that's yeah. the issue me as well but, but it's just like it's proven that these cause the point is that it's, it's terrible for the people involved in the manufacturing yeah and like the whole community mm -hmm. and then the last one is there's a ton more and there's like mercury and stuff it's so insane to me and then there's formaldehyde is the last thing that Ooh. i like spoke on and it's like when clothing is being stored or like the textiles because like you take the cotton you leave it into like sheets of this gray fabric so like there's a lot of storage then obviously when they're shipped but they put formaldehyde they like pump it into these storage units to preserve the clothing and prevent mold and like decay basically now that you're now that you're drawing up all these vivid images yeah what's stunning to me is that i've never actually seen any of these images like i don't think i've ever seen a, pictures from inside one of these factories or even one of these chambers where you say they hold the clothes with formaldehyde mm -hmm. or like the lead or the dyeing i've literally never seen any images of it but even with food i feel like we get exposés about yeah. wow this is what factory farming in the u.s looks like and this is mm -hmm. you know what really goes into a hot dog and stuff like that yeah i feel like there needs to be a similar type of consciousness uh with regards to the hot dogs of fashion which i yeah. guess would be like the fast fashion t-shirt like these that i'm where i got all this information like unicef greenpeace and the national institute of ecology and environment they all did exposés on this and there's pictures and stuff it just seems like it's not very publicized i know it's just strange how few people i guess know the extent to which this is going on yeah because it's like and i always think like the factories that they're letting people into must be like the best of what do you mean worst. letting people into like if greenpeace is going in and taking oh, pictures right, yeah of course they, they're not the worst not there's the even worst. worse ones yeah yeah and like some of the pictures that i saw from these were just like terrifying makes you want to start growing your own cotton the problem is it's so overwhelming an industry like it's so easy just to be kind of nihilistic and be like well yeah the big corporations all use slave labor but it's just like the scope of this like goes beyond our ability that, to comprehend. I know, comprehend. That, that's why it makes it hard to, to think of yourself as having any say in it. Mm -hmm. I know that's the, the case with a ton of environmental issues. Yeah, because like to, for the most part we don't. Like, but the pictures do help it, a lot. You can't. Like the pictures help a lot though. Yeah. Because I, I think seeing factory farming in documentaries and stuff energize people. Yeah. Then and you kind of have images to throw back at the corporations to be like, yeah. look at this. Mm -hmm. But here it's like there's images but they're not as graphic as and they're just not widespread yeah is what i mean yeah so that's what we're hoping to expose today <laughs> if you have anyone in your life who's like really into fast fashion just let them listen to this obviously we have no images but mental images yeah. it's like reading a book so is that what you had on manufacturing yes it's such a it's so vast maybe i'll try and share some resources that i like found because they're really easy to read in that it's so much stuff you don't know mm. so you just feel like you're learning and it kind of empowers you to like do something about it yeah what's next in the process um the next two i had were called shipping and shopping online separately mm -hmm. but they turned out to be very similar so maybe i'll yeah, just discuss them together cool um whether buying online or in person from a local store the materials have often been shipped several times over to get to you like before you buy them mm. i think when we buy clothes like I had this thing online or before I started, sorry, I had this idea that like, oh, well, obviously buying online is bad because you have to ship it. But it's like, well, buying in store is bad as well because it's been shipped there. Yeah. It's just when the shipping happens. Like, yeah. it's not that it emits less per se. Mm. The reason that online might be worse in terms of shipping is because almost everybody clicks the button and says like next day or fast shipping. Yeah. Which goes by plane rather than a boat mm. which just emits way more like yeah. several magnitudes it's worse for the environment um so to people i would say ship slow you know have yeah. patience it's just way 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 better there's like a debate over which is actually better for the environment ship uh, shopping online versus in brick and mortar stores mm. and it doesn't seem settled to me um because like i said 
the clothes are being shipped to you regardless, but for, for clothes anyway, the argument is that, well, the customer doesn't have to drive to the store, so that some emission's gone right there, and this, there's no store that has to be powered. Yeah. Which is another, it's like a non-trivial amount of energy which goes into powering mm -hmm. stores. The kind of argument against online shopping is that 30% of clothes bought online are returned, compared to 6% for in-person. So it and literally has to make the whole journey again. Yeah. And then, like, again, if you're exchanging it. Yeah. And also, something like 20% of these returns end up in landfills because they can't be resold. Really? Yeah. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> um, so there's, like, pros and cons to both of them, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> the thing with, like, ethical shopping is there's no, like, that's, that's a lie. There's few local ethical shops so, like you often have to order online from either like etsy or like another brand and i always kind of wondered I was like why does it take so long compared to like other things like there's still these ships and these planes coming it's probably because they're trying to be like no like, yeah those are smaller time. companies so they have less sway yeah like that um just some a funny stat that i saw about fast shipping which i just said was really bad in the usa the, like the website I was reading framed this as a positive. It said, 44% of customers said that they were willing to wait two days for fast shipping orders. I was like, the, impati what? the impatience which everyone is now kind of accustomed to is crazy. And I feel it myself. Like you make an order and it doesn't come within the week. Yeah. It's like, why is this taking so long? This is ridiculous. Yeah. And try to get upset about it because we're all kind of addicted to that dopamine rush we get by unpackaging a new t-shirt mm. or whatever. Who's paying these people? Paying what people? Sorry. Like, who's paying this random truck to come to the middle of nowhere with my Amazon my Amazon box full of socks and cupcake liners yes. at 3 a.m.? Like, who's paying them? Who's pay Like, there's... The cost of that is, like, so insane. Like, there's an environmental cost. There's, mm. like, this person's time. Yeah. That's... It doesn't equate. Like, I paid $4 well, for this package to get here. I don't see how it pays for it. What's the name for that? It's like the true cost. Yeah, the true cost. True cost is basically what would be the cost of your iPhone or your jeans if it incorporated the actual cost of what the labor should be as well as if it's exploitative and also the, the environmental cost. Yeah. And it's always like in the hundreds or thousands. Yeah. Like it's always way, way, way more than what we're used to paying. Mm -hmm. um, it's like how many corners were cut? so many how many corners were cut <laughs> yeah i couldn't find a stat of how much time people spend online browsing clothes the stat that i found was that roughly 59 percent of online shopping is clothes so we can kind of try and extrapolate that from maybe an estimation and just say it's a lot of time spent online yeah so it's, it's like a, again like a non-trivial amount of energy used i suppose browsing these websites yeah but i didn't really think that was anything major about shopping online that's kind of the environmentalism of it i wanted to discuss like mental effects that it might have like what is the difference between sitting in your, in your chair and just like browsing through pages and pages an endless pit of appealing clothes yeah compared to having to go to a store and touch them file through shelves yeah i actually what, like don't have to make choices anymore isn't there more of a choice? It's like there's two extremes. Either you just like you know what you want and you search until you find it. Mm. Or like you go on to H and M and there's like a million choices. So you either have like decision fatigue, which is like a very serious issue in the modern world, or you just like get exactly what you want all the time. I think both of those things are bad. Yeah, I'm definitely much more towards the latter. Yeah. So when I'm buying clothes I always have these outrageously specific requests. Yeah. And like I'm happy if I find it. But then I'm thinking, this isn't probably how we're supposed to live. No. Like but objectively, it's like, well, now I get to... Dress exactly how I want. Yeah. Yeah. But it seems like there's something lost in that convenience. Mm -hmm. And I think someday, when the world is degrown, I'll miss that to an extent. Of course. But, like, I'll get to... It's the same with streaming music. Yeah. It's like, well, you can listen to any music you want everywhere you are, anytime. Mm-hmm. It's like, I don't know, is there something lost compared to just having a few records and being able to spin those? Yeah. It's probably something lost. I think so. Probably something about, well, resources, I think. When you're going through a store, 
or let's say you have a mall mm -hmm. and you're like okay the mall has 15 stores or something yeah the t-shirt that i want has to be in these 15 stores mm -hmm. and so you i think you might absorb an impression of what our relationship to resources is and that it isn't infinite yeah. whereas when you're working online i mean it's, it's, it's infinite. infinite yeah like you can just there are so many different t-shirts you can look through mm -hmm. yeah i think that's the way it is i think so i kind of think what we're getting at with that conversation is in the future world where there is where things are made locally the well-being will probably be higher than what it is right now and we may think but now we're going to have less choice we're going to be less individual more choice doesn't actually make you happier no even if you prefer the more things doesn't make you happier yeah and i just think our well-being will be much higher but it's hard to like imagine that it's like i'll have less i'll have less choice i'll have more work to do maybe in mending my clothes and in shearing my sheep <laughs> yeah <laughs> But like you'll be happier, we promise. <laughs> we mentioned this last week when you talked about tartan in the Scottish Highlands. Mm -hmm. But clothes used to have a local identity. They still do for a lot of places, but that's kind of rapidly deteriorating. Mm -hmm. Is this a bad thing? The fact that the age of information and globalization has kind of ensured that all materials and designs are shared. Mm -hmm. Is that a bad thing? I'll say no. Just because, like... We talked about this with architecture in one episode as well. Yeah. It's very hard to say. Because... I think culturally it's 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 not a good thing. Because then you have, like, no choice. You can't be like, I want to move here because I like the fashion. And I like the exactly. aesthetics. Exactly. That, that, like, that is very quickly... It's like, no matter where you move, you're going to get basically the same thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there's, like... I think local identities isn't a bad thing when it's separated from patriotism or nationalism oh, yeah i don't think yeah. it has to be that at all no i don't think so but it often is so like it's, that's the only reason i say like it's hard to say yeah i've seen a few people online terming like it seems like i see more more criticism of high-speed media and social media and the internet more and more these days so i'm happy about so. that people are becoming more aware of it yeah like i went out to eat today and we were talking with the waitress and she said something like like i stopped all that referring to like listening to the news being on social media because she said it she's like it's getting too much and i'm like it's bad for people to just like kind of choose to be ignorant because like we can't really choose to be ignorant i don't think it's bad to shut off but that's another that's another either. conversation it is but um, it was like something i said i heard her say and i was like this is maybe a good thing to be unplugging yeah of, when of we're course yeah. the whole point of the podcast no i know <laughs> but I, I feel like when we're talking about these big issues like we want people to know about this Anyway, I've seen it termed more and more something like low-grade telepathy. The quote I saw was, society really wasn't ready for low-grade telepathy. Because that's basically what the internet is. Yeah. And that's what I'm thinking, that just made me think of it as like fashion sharing. It's like, well, maybe Paris used to look different to other cities. Yeah. And now it doesn't. Now every city looks the same. Yeah. Architecturally and fashion-wise as well. Completely different. You mentioned a stat like this earlier, but I found something. I found this online and I was like, Wow, this says it all. In America in 1960, the average household spent over 10% of its income on clothing and shoes. Usually, a person bought less than 25 garments a year. And 95% of these clothes were made in the USA. Compared to today, or 2013, which is when this article I thought was written, it said, in a household, less than 3.5% of income was spent on clothing and shoes despite this kind of less amount of money spent on it, mm -hmm. almost 70 garments per person were purchased per year and 2% were made in the USA. That's like, that's the stat I've always been looking for. Because that explains our like... It basically, ba so like, the conclusion is people spend less on more clothes. Yeah. Um, it's and like, why can't they afford the artisanal hat? That's why. Yeah, and the, um, the clothes don't last as long. And I know this is skewed a bit by... I think by rich people, because I was thinking about it and I was like, most people, like my economic class, which I would mm -hmm. just say like middle or whatever, mm -hmm. most people don't buy 70 garments a year. So I do think it's skewed a bit by the extreme inequality we see today. Yeah. Like that stat is probably brought up by a, like a bunch of celebrities buying 3,000 garments a year or something I like suppose, that. I suppose, yeah. Um, and I know also that the economy is different, so maybe people just can't spend 10% of their income on clothes anymore. Like, mm -hmm. I know the, these things, but still, it 
if anything, it serves to illustrate the fact that we're spending, like we're buying clothes of less quality. Yeah. We're buying way more of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's what I had for shipping and kind of the the outsourcing of a lot of our clothes productions. Yeah. So does that maybe bring us to like talking about the seasons and like the fashion cycle? Yeah. Cool. So there's this fashion cycle. We're taught it in business and it's talked talking not necessarily about clothes, but about all trends. And so it goes like there's the introduction of something, the rise in sales. So there's like the first movers, like the trendsetters who start wearing it. In the introduction phase, then the rise in sales happens as like people start to produce it and like sell it. There's the peak when like everyone's wearing it, decline where it's still sold and maybe people are like starting to put it on the sale racks and the trendsetters are starting to kind of pick up some new things. And then there's rejection where it's like that's ugly, that's out of style. Yeah. And this used to happen every 10 years or so for like pieces of clothing. Okay. So th then there started being like the two fashion weeks a year in France and then the box stores and like the H&Ms of the world started like producing the clothes super cheap and then in a few years there were like five fashion weeks per year all over the world setting these trends. They started having not just like spring, summer, fall, winter, they started being like resort season which would be selling like sandals sandals and then there'd be Bathing like suits yeah there's just like a lot of different seasons they all have like weird names so they started like speeding up this curve to basically happen every few weeks hmm. like zara has 24 lines released in a year yeah 24 different rollouts yeah mm. that's just kind of wild so they have this they push this curve so fast that it goes 24 times in a year basically yeah and like there's small changes each time that's always been the thing it's like maybe over the 10 years there were like a few small changes to like amount to the big change hmm. but if you're doing it 24 times the fashion's changing so quickly people are trying to keep up basically and i guess trends don't last 10 years anymore no i'm thinking about like jogging pants mm -hmm. like that was one that came to mind for 2010s yeah it's like that was maybe four years or something yeah and now we're like firmly in rejection and have been maybe for maybe two years hmm. anything else come to so. mind trend-wise currently currently i read an article by vogue it was all of the different like they called artistic directors of like gucci and louis vuitton and such and they were all basically like denouncing seasons and they said we need to go back to just the two seasons and they're more practical basically trying to say yeah in winter we want to start selling winter gear because don't you find that when you go to the store in like november and you want a winter coat and there's weirdly like just not the right stuff there I find that sometimes. What do you mean? Say. Firstly, I just want to say it's funny that Vogue would publish a piece when, in my eyes, that they would be, they and such publications would be the most complicit in. Yeah. And they're the ones that constantly. Yeah, basically. like the rapid seasons. Yeah, but this was published like a few weeks ago, and mm -hmm. it was basically more of like a Corona response. Uh, people yeah, were kind of making sense. it seem like it's the trendy thing. Well, like, you know, you know, maybe that will do some good. I'm hoping, to an extent, it will stop these rapid cycles of insanity. So you go to. A store in November to try and buy a coat. Yeah. But they're already... Let's not use November. Let's say you go in July. But they're always, already starting to put out, like, the back-to-school things, which are more oh, geared yeah. it towards happens, fall. Oh, yeah. It happens earlier every year. And it's like, I want a bathing suit. Like, I want shorts because it's literally summer. But they're starting to sell jeans and, like, hoodies mm. for back-to-school. Yeah. And I've always kind of found that, but it's getting worse. Of course. It's also the case with cars. It's like... Oh, you can roll out your new 2022 Mazda. Wait, wait, what? <laughs> 2020. <laughs> yeah. Like it's literally impossible. But it, but it happens every. It happens earlier every time. Yeah. So that's something weird I found, and I'm hoping, according to, Mr. Alessandro Michel from Gucci, hopefully that'll be the <laughs> future, and like they'll start actually selling things on time. Okay. Which would be really cool. What's next, Dan? Seasons. Yeah, materials grown, manufactured bought shipped converted into seasons they arrive and you have your new t-shirt and now it's time to wash it uh-oh <laughs> this is something that <laughs> laundry day um <laughs> i feel like we don't often hear about when it comes to sustainable fashion we hear about every other every other aspect of this and i think it's because this is the one which puts the blame squarely on the consumer on us so mm -hmm. people don't want to talk about it because yeah. it's way easier to blame Vogue 
or H&M or whatever. And like it is their fault to an yeah. extent. But it's but just this saying, is one like, really big thing we can change. Yeah. Don't wash your clothes ever. That's what we do. <laughs> <laughs> if I have no friends, that's my uh, solution. But seriously, I always thought people wash their clothes too much. They wash them too often. And I'm obviously like underwear and socks, things like that need to be washed. Yeah. But let's say you're wearing a t-shirt and you have a day at the office, the air-conditioned office, no less. Yes. It doesn't need to be washed, man. Do the smell test. Do mm -hmm. the stain test. I mean, for me, I, like, drop a lot of food, so maybe you need to wash it. I washed my clothes by hand last year. Yes. In the bathtub. It took me a very long time. I didn't get them clean remotely. Yes. Um, wouldn't recommend. I don't know why I said that, but... It was an example. Yeah, I would definitely recommend that everyone try it. Mm -hmm. But I didn't use any rocks or anything, so it didn't work really well. No, I think if you had a washboard, it would have been, like, fine. Well, one method which people used to use was just rubbing the clothes against each other. Yeah. It didn't work. I know Maybe I just wasn't made strong enough. Things. Yeah, they probably need to need to be coarser materials. Anyway, a washing machine, it's hard to find the efficiency on appliances because there's such a huge variation because mm. recently there's been such a push for more efficient um, things. For more, yeah. for more efficient ones. But I saw that the absolute worst ones can be somewhere from two thousand to twenty five hundred watts, which is pretty bad. Yeah. Um, and the best ones can cut it down to something like 500, 300 watts. Yeah. But it still is, uses like 40 gallons of water. Yeah. Um, and a dryer, which is the, which is way worse than a washing machine. The dryer is essentially the bad guy in yeah. addition to polyester. The dryer is second only to the fridge in terms of most households' monthly electric use by appliance. Yeah. Which is crazy because the fridge is on 24-7. Yeah. I mean, I know that like fire exceeds everything, but the dryer mm -hmm. is like more than a TV, more than a dishwasher, more than a washing machine um, by some distance. Um, and it can top out at about 5,000 watts. It's so easy just to hang up your clothes or like have one of those like, I know when you tried to hand wash your clothes, you had some issues. Yes. But when they're spun in the washing machine, all the water is kind of like already out of them. So it's behind me, a pair of my overalls hanging up on the wall. <laughs> you can just like kind of hang your things around to dry them when they've been washed in the washing machine. Yeah. And it just is going to save a ton of electricity. Mm -hmm. I was watching a video and it was like, sorry, I'm kind of co-opting here. No, that's fine. Take station. over. And it was basically, it was like, and now the clothes get home where Wilbur's, it'll begin its most resource intensive phase of its life. Yeah, it is. Just think about it. You're washing it for like, say you keep something for four years. You're washing it so many times. Wash it and less. Wash it less. Unless it's underwear. But like wash your underwear. But just your underwear. You can wash your jeans once a month. I'm going to go once a year. Oh, my. I bought these really heavy-duty... I heavy bought duty. his first pair of jeans. <laughs> yeah. They're, well, they're heavy-duty, and it was like, you pretty much don't need to wash these. And I was like, okay. Yeah. If they don't smell and, I, and they don't stain, like... I guess it's also something about changing consumer behaviors, because there's mm -hmm. probably people listening to this, like... It's disgusting. Yeah. But ask yourself, maybe, why do you think that? Mm -hmm. It's like, I don't know. Maybe I just have a a higher capacity for disgust than most people. I think I do. But also when it comes to clothes, it's just like... But like we're wearing undergarments. We're not out in the field. Yeah, a quarter of a garment's carbon footprint over its lifespan comes from washing it. Um, washing machines account for 17% of home water use. Some brands I saw which are kind of pioneering, either just telling people, hey, you don't need to wash this as much, making normal clothes, yeah. or just making clothes which don't need to be washed as much, are called... A couple I saw were called Wool and Prince and Pangea. And the former uses wool. And the guy who founded it, or one of the guys who founded it, used to market for Unilever, which is like that yeah. huge corporation with a bunch of different branches. And a quote from him I saw, which made him kind of break off and start this brand, was that the only way to grow as a laundry detergent brand is to make customers feel like they need to keep washing their clothes more and more. Yeah, so that makes sense. Don't be pawns. Don't wash your clothes at all. Yeah. Or if you Have do, a... just try and make it the most efficient way possible. Because the thing is, like, if you're listening to this and like, ew, I don't want to stop washing my clothes, wash them by hand then. Or wash them cool and don't wash them for as long. If you feel like you just need that feeling of, like, renewal or whatever, it's like, yeah. okay, but just don't, really don't wash them for as long because most clothes don't need it. Why well, do we need 50 minutes? We don't shower for 50 minutes. Yeah. 
but, like... but some fabrics I saw which these companies were using, which can help and don't have to be washed so often. Mm, like probably like antimicrobial stuff. Yeah. Um, because this is something which I learned was that sweat itself is pretty clean. But it's when it's absorbed into clothes that it attracts bacteria Mm -hmm. and starts to smell. So it's like, get clothes which don't absorb them. Mm -hmm. And this brand, Pangea, they use peppermint oil and seaweed fiber um, to basically make them stay fresher between washes so you don't have to wash them so often. Yeah. And that's what I was thinking about, just like, get really scientific. Like, cook something up in a lab. Yeah. Because I'm sure there's all these kind of compounds which are as yet undiscovered, which need to be washed like once every 60 days or something yeah and you could just add a drop of it to the fabric you're weaving exactly, yeah. and it'd be fine mm-hmm. like, it doesn't have to be super unsustainable in these crazy factories adding all these crazy chemicals crazy but so that's what i have for clothes washing crazy crazy and we have one more step before the episode's over thankfully end of life do you know what i realized when writing this section what pretty much all the clothing ends up in the dumps Yes. Or being burned. Yes. Because I always think to myself, I'm like, oh, I'll just donate it. But and someone's going to buy it or some, or the corporation's going to just throw it out if it's not good enough for them. Yeah. And it's going to just end up in a landfill. Because like there aren't these institutions in place to recycle the things. That reminds me of this quote about plastic bags. You know, plastic bags which are banned from so many grocery stores now. Because mm-hmm. there are people who are actually in support of them being sold. And they're like, but I reuse them. It's not single use. I'll use it again. And it's like... Well, then it's double use. It still just gets yeah. thrown out or triple use. Like, it's still it's going to go the same place. You just yeah. prolong it a little bit. So, I feel like this is a good transition in next week's episode for those of you doing the double header. We want, like... <laughs> <laughs> that one's doing the double header. <laughs> yeah, probably. Uh, so, we're going to do, like... There's something called, like, cradle to cradle. And the current model is cradle to grave. So, like, everything ends up in the grave, which is a landfill or being burnt or some something like that but we need to make these things circular so it just always keeps coming back and reusing the resources that have already been used but everything basically ends up in the garbage and the equivalent of one garbage truck full of clothes is burned or dumped into landfills every second (laughs) (laughs) hilarious Um, in a year that's enough to fill sydney harbor in australia i'm just textile i'm sure you just came up with that stat yourself yeah i did i (laughs) thought to myself how big is Sydney Harbour? How big is the dump truck? And I did you the did math. did the math. So, like, 85% goes into landfills. Then the leftover, 15%, some of it's burned. And there's about, like, I think it's 7% is recycled. Yeah. So you need to think about when you're getting rid of your clothes. Either the best thing to do is to reuse them, essentially. Mm-hmm. To use them as long as you possibly can. Mend them. Just wear it, even if it's out of style. If you really want to get rid of it, if you're really fashiony, give it to someone that you know will love it. And then maybe say to them, when you're done with it, give it back to me, and then you can, like, find a use for it, basically. But try not to just, like, put it out of out of sight. Because I have that really bad habit of just, like, donating it. But not to an organization I know what they do with it. So I need to make that change. And I feel like we all kind of have that habit being like, oh, I'm donating it, donating it, like donate it to a shelter or to give it to a person, you know, or like sell it, I guess. But try and like make sure you know where it is. Yeah. Because when you buy something, you're taking responsibility for it for its whole life. Yeah. And that would come with the clothes being more expensive as well. This is definitely the part of the lifespan, which is most, it makes you think the most positively. Yeah, Cause I it, think it, so. like it sparks ideas in your mind about like okay well there could be donation bins governments could be involved with corporations you know there could be partnerships there could be mm-hmm. it could be a weekly pickup as is plastic and organics here where we recycle and stuff it's like yeah. this seems like i'm not so pessimistic about closing those loops it seems yeah. very doable to me i think so and even like some corporations are doing that themselves like patagonia when you buy your clothes like they have stores within their stores that like sell the reused stuff there's a lot of potential for it yeah to bring us out this week i did message a few people on instagram to get their thoughts and like kind of the things that inspired my research for this week so i'd like to thank them because it was very nice of them so i remember when i was talking about the chemicals i said i like literally didn't know about this or didn't think about the really specifics 
until the account and they're also a podcast it's called sustainability of and they brought it to my attention that there's a bunch of chemicals involved in the process and it made me think what chemicals and they also told me that you don't have to disclose any of the information like companies have no obligation to disclose to you that there's lead in your shirt no no and that's the case with like a lot of food and a lot of products basically there's like no regulations and it's the biggest thing with consumer tech Mm -hmm. like you can really really push for transparency and accountability um it's one of the few benefits i see from everybody being connected yeah it's like i don't know there shouldn't be these secrets anymore it should all come out Mm -hmm. i mean it it does very slowly but and it will but yeah yeah cool there's a couple more i asked these people like what's the one thing you'd want to be exposed and the sussed rose said they would expose the amount of waste that happens at literally every stage of the life cycle of a garment. So that's what we talked about. Hopefully we expose that. I hope so. And then there's an account called S sustainably underscore. And they said they would expose that your clothes were probably made in sweatshop conditions. And I think we did a good job of exposing that. That's one of the things that is like more commonly known, but definitely just like push the people in your life to like, like face them with it be like yes this is made it's misery inducing in and it's and it's despair inducing but you know it's uh this important. is a very like optimistic there's a lot of innovations and i'm really excited to talk with them so there's like so much opportunity for good things to happen as we've talked about this whole series like fashion is like the closest thing it like sparks revolution and i believe it can well said. i'm clenching both my fists right yeah. now because i can't i'm so excited everyone, hopefully you can all feel alicia's energy and yeah. hopefully next week, or if you're doing the double header immediately after this, <laughs> you can uh, feel that energy release in uh, a gush of Song. positivity, <laughs> um, enthusiasm, and perhaps even, indeed, musicality. Um, if you're interested in hearing more of our thoughts on fashion, the environment, culture, art, technology, science, and just some behind-the-scenes pictures of us chilling at camp, or perhaps in trees or something like that who knows um you can follow us on instagram at the underscore environmental and we also started a tumblr if any of you are on that <laughs> please find us find on there us. as well we don't know how to find you <laughs> <laughs> yeah um, please help us <laughs> hope you enjoyed the episode and have a great day <laughs>